giving you a reason to look forward to Mondays. We are the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to the 51st episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name is Eric, and we are excited to have you with us today. Paperback Warrior is the Internet's best source for news and reviews about vintage paperbacks from the 20th century, with a focus on hard-boiled crime, men's adventure, Western, and espionage fiction. We have a blog at paperbackwarrior.com with daily reviews, and you'll find the podcast every Monday morning with free episode archives available all the time at no cost. Let me introduce my partner, Tom, who's going to tell us about the feature today. Thanks, Eric. Today's feature is about a shadowy character who is a real-life CIA operative writing a lot of vintage paperbacks. Of course, I'm talking about Howard Hunt. We're going to discuss his life and review some of his books for you. I'm also going to review a Western novel that you should know about called 44 by H.A. DeRosso. Eric, what's your review today? I'll be reviewing End of a Stripper by... Robert Dietrich. Also known as? Howard Hunt. (laughs) All right. It's a a very hunty episode. Yeah. Uh, Before we get into all that, you've actually been doing some shopping, Eric. Indeed. Uh, So my wife and I were heading down south to Merritt Island. This was a couple Sundays ago, and I wasn't real familiar with this particular road, or really this part of town. Uh, Merritt Island's, I don't know, about two and a half hours south, and it goes down through some really rural patches. And I'm passing all of these antique stores and these thrift shops along the way. And all of them are closed uh, because it's the weekend or, or, heck, maybe they're just closed indefinitely because of the pandemic. Uh, but along the side of the road, we spot this uh, – it's like a shack, Tom. It's like just a dirty shack. And so uh, I told my wife, you know, I was going to pull in, and she's like, hey. And thankfully, she just said it was okay. So we pull in, and I'm, I'm kind of looking around the corner just to see if the thing's open. And there's just a dude sitting in a chair in the driveway. So I'm like, well, I, I guess they're open. Was he was he whittling? <laughs> he was doing something in his lab. I I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to think don't, about don't, what. Don't assume. <laughs> I don't want to think about what he's doing. But I kind of just walked past him. I was like, hey, you know, hello, and he said hi. Anyway, I'm digging through the shed, and he's got like a motorcycle buried back there. He's got an old car. He's got like old dolls and mattresses and just all kinds of crap that nobody would want, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm just, I'm giving up here. It's like, like a junk shop. It's horrible. <laughs> and I'm just kind of giving up. I'm like, you know, I'm throwing in the towel. Well, and then I spot this old plastic rack in, in one of the uh, outbuildings that had a bunch of paperbacks on it. Yeah. So I'm digging through there and it's the typical stuff. Stuart Woods and Dean Arcoons and, uh, and all that stuff. So I'm like, this is all just a bunch of best-selling crap. Huh? Yeah. I don't want that. Hey, that's why they're best-sellers. They're everywhere. <laughs> but for some odd reason, Tom, here's the crazy thing. In a stack, he had... All these Modesty Blaze books. Um, Modesty Blaze, the uh, Peter O'Donnell paperbacks. Yeah, the uh, the spy novels, uh, the ones that were from, I don't know, the 60s and 70s. Those are so good. <laughs> yes. So get this. He's got uh, he's got 11... No, no, he had a 13 Modesty Blaze novels, right? And there's 11 in the whole series, but he had uh, three doubles in there. Uh, but here's what I got. Here's what I got. I got Modesty Blaze, the first one, and these are in order, Sabretooth, I, Lucifer, A Taste for Death, The Impossible Virgin, Pieces of Modesty, The Silver Mistress, Last Day in Limbo, The Xanadu Talisman, The Night of Morningstar. And I'm missing now Dead Man's Handle and a short story collection called Cobra Trap. Otherwise, I have the whole freaking thing. In one fell swoop. In one fell swoop. And uh, I paid $6 for the whole stack. Wow. And uh, anyway, I got uh, three extras here, oh, so you nice. can you can have those. This and is very kind of you. Uh, you're handing me co- copies of the Impossible Virgin, the original Modesty Blaze, which I have, but I'll still take from you, and I Lucifer. So, well, thank you. That's very generous of you. Uh, the Modesty Blaze series. People, I think, oftentimes lump it into like the Baroness and kind of those those stupid uh, women spy novels to try to take advantage of the. Uh, kind of sexy James Bond thing, but the Modesty Blaze books were just very good on their own. They're very smart. Peter O'Donnell was an excellent writer, and uh, I reviewed the first one on paperbackwarrior.com. People should check that out. Awesome. Uh, have you been uh, getting any paperbacks lately? Yes, I did some book shopping at local stores here in Jacksonville, and I bought some good stuff on eBay. I'm going to give you three highlights. I'm going to hand these to you one at a time to get your shocking reaction. The first one is called Wim- Woman's Battalion, or is it oh, Women's geez. Battalion? 
Yeah, Women's Battalion. Uh, By W.A. Ballinger. It says their guns were deadly, their knives were sharp, and they had other weapons. Now, W.A. Ballinger was a pseudonym for H. Howard Baker, who also wrote as Peter Saxon. Confusingly, he's different than Bill Ballinger, although they wrote in the same era and the same genre. Uh, I'll post the cover to Women's Battalion on our Facebook page, and you'll see exactly why I bought it. It has Mm -hmm. various sexy women with machine guns bursting, uh, and machine guns, and they're also bursting from their blouses. (laughs) The tagline, as you said, is their guns were deadly, their knives were sharp, and they had other weapons. Interestingly, the book actually seems to follow a Russian battalion of female fighters in World War II as the Nazi blitzkrieg steamrolled over Russian soil. It sounds like it has a little bit of romance and intrigue and fighting, and if I end up reading it, I will absolutely let you, the listener, know. Since we're on the topic of Nazis, I also got, and I'm going to hand this across the table to you, Nazi Hunter by Mark Mandel. It's a pinnacle book from 1981. Near as I can tell, this book kicked off a five-book series that concluded in 1983. The author, Mark Mandel, is a real dude, and he also wrote some of the SOB series and the Executioner series and Deathlands books. When he writes those series, he does, he does them under a pseudonym inside a house name. This guy's like in the Witness Protection Program. The pseudonym he uses is Alan Philipson. And according to the Glorious Trash blog, um, is my source for that, the Nazi hunter is this American soldier named Kurt Jaeger who finds that he's the son of a Nazi war criminal, which causes him to swear a blood vengeance against his own dad and every other retired Nazi he can find from the Third Reich. It looks good, and uh, hopefully I'll get to it. Uh, lastly, I want to hand you this one here. Have you seen this series before? Let's take a look. You ever seen these? No. Okay, so it's the first book in the Ian Quayle Secret Agent series by Alan Kalu Cal- 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 from 1986. The cover, as you can see, is very 1986. Now, Kalu is the author of a highly regarded series starring Colonel Tobin and his men getting into various combat situations. He also had an adventure series starring Cabot Kane. Now, his real name is Alan Lyle Smythe, and he was a Brit who lived from 1914 to 2006. Dig this. He was married to the same woman for 67 years. Wow. From 1939 to 2006. She was. Anyway, Alan Ian Quayle, Secret Agent. The series only lasted for two books. And hmm. I, got, I got book number one. Spy Guys and Gals, one of my favorite uh, websites out there, gave the series a C- and said that the main character is a jerk. Mm. which ruined it for Randall, the reviewer over there at Spy Guys and Gals. But I couldn't resist. It was a cheap book. Um, so those are my shopping trip. I also want to recognize a reprint house that hooked us up with some good stuff. The company's called Bold Venture Press. And the company is run by a husband and wife, Rich and Audrey, out of Sunrise, Florida. They, they put together these beautiful pulp reprints as, uh, in paperbacks with awesome covers. And they also, re- they also create compilations of stories from the pulps and release them on Bold Venture Press. Uh, Bold Venture Press sent along some ebooks that our listeners may enjoy. The first one's called Primal Spillane. And it's an anthology of Mickey Spillane short stories from 1941 and 1942, edited by Max Allen Collins and Lynn Myers. I know we have a ton of Mickey Spillane fans listening, so this one is a must-own. And years ago, I reviewed a Private Eye novel by a guy named Bruce Cassidy, starring his short-lived hero, Cash Madigan. As I recall, I thought it was good, but not great. Anyway, Bold Venture Press sent an ebook of another Cash Madigan novel called Murder Trail. And Murder Trail was originally a paperback called While Murder Waits that I'm handing across to you also. The, um, it was also in the ebook that Bold Venture Press has put out contains a Cash Madigan short story as a bonus. And I may actually revisit the series. Now that I think about it, I might have been a little hard on Cash Madigan, and I want to give that Bruce Cassidy guy a shot. Anyway, please visit boldventurepress.com to see what they have going on. They, their paperback reprints are amazing. They really take a lot of care in bringing these mid-century uh, fiction titles back to market. Um, anything else? Are you ready for the feature? We're going to jam. Okay, let's do it. Transition Music Maestro. Our feature today is about an author named Howard Hunt, and there's a lot that can be said about the life of Howard Hunt. He was fictionalized in movies, most recently in the Martin Scorsese Oscar-nominated film The Irishman from last year. There have been books about him relating to the Watergate break-ins of the President Nixon era, 
and he's even part of many conspiracy theories involving the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, Hunt himself has written nonfiction books about his life, and we're going to touch on some of those career highlights, but I really want to make the focus here his genre fiction. We, you know, we're the Paperback Warrior podcast is what we do. After all, the guy wrote 73 books in his life, with the vast majority being the kind of cheapo paperbacks with lurid covers that we, uh, we talk about here. I should say from the outset that my primary sources for this segment are is the Encyclopedia of Pulp Fiction Writers by Lee Server. You ever seen this? It's a reference book. It's, it's over there. It's the bottom one there. And that I think section. you showed that to me at one it's point. It's a really good reference book. Um, and a paperback confidential by Brian Ritt, which is my, kind of my go-to for these podcast uh, features. Uh, both are excellent reference books about our favorite genres. Okay, so let's get to the guy. His name was Everett Howard Hunt Jr., he lived from 1918 to 2007. Now, his birthplace was Hamburg, New York, but he died in Miami at age 88. He attended Brown University, and for our foreign listeners, it's a very prestigious Ivy League school. During, during World War II, he started out with the Navy on a destroyer called the USS Mayo, and then he went to the Army Air Corps, and he finished with a stint in the OSS in China. And as many people know, the OSS was the wartime precursor to the American CIA. So from 1949 to 1970, he was an actual case officer in the CIA itself. And all this time, and I still can't get my, this through my head, starting in 1942, he wrote novels. Even during the war itself, he wrote and sold books. He began writing under his own name, but then he employed a bunch of pseudonyms that we're going to discuss later. I'm baffled how a guy with, you know, like him or hate him, a pretty demanding job as a damn spy found the time to write so many 180-page novels. I also found it interesting that the CIA was comfortable letting him pursue this side hustle as an author of Pulp Fiction. It seems inconceivable to me that a CIA spy writing spy novels really ran the risk of giving some secret or tradecraft away. I can't believe the CIA approved these. An article I read that said that the CIA actually did approve them. They did pre-publication reviews of all of his novels written while he was employed by the CIA. And I can tell you there's just no way that would happen today. So when the 1950s rolled around and paperback originals were all the craze, Howard Hunt was in a very good position to take advantage of this trend and sell a lot of books under a lot of different names. So for our non-American listeners, I want to fill you in on this. In 1972, President Richard Nixon was running for re-election. There were a group of men beholden to the president, some of whom worked for him, some of whom were recruited by people who worked for him, who were caught burglarizing the Democratic National Committee headquarters, which was President Nixon's opposition party. The headquarters of the DNC, as they called it, was at a hotel called the Watergate in Washington, D.C., and one of the burglars who got caught was Howard Hunt. It became known as the Watergate scandal, and one of the central questions was, what did the president know about this burglary, and when did he know it? Now, the burglary actually led to the resignation of President Nixon, and uh, our guy, Howard Hunt, among others, went to prison for his part of the burglary. So he gets out of prison in 1978, and he writes a bunch of political and spy thrillers that were kind of big and bloated. We're talking 20 books between 1980 and 2000. They had a real right-wing slant and uh, super conservative themes, sort of a niche that became successful later with authors like Brad Thor and the ghost writers who write the thrillers of William Johnstone. Anyway, in, 19, in 2007, he dies of pneumonia in Miami, and he's buried up in Hamburg, New York. So I want to circle back to his books, focusing on the vintage paperback fiction. People who know a lot about Howard Hunt's fiction, and I'm no expert myself, all agree that he was kind of a hack. Uh, like, he was never anybody's favorite author from the paperback original era, but his books have this workmanlike quality to them, and what I've read, um, he wasn't horrible at all. Now, conventional wisdom is that his best novel was called Bimini Run, and it came out right when paperback originals were coming out in 1949. It was released under Hunt's own name. It's about a hard-drinking guy who gets a job as first mate on a yacht with a wealthy client. The wealthy husband on board has a wife who's got her eyes on her hero. The first mate and the wife come up with a scheme to kill the rich husband, and it sounds like every Gil Brewer novel ever written. The Rap Sheet blog, uh, a source that I trust, says that his writing style owed a lot to both Ernest Hemingway and Raymond Chandler in this book. 
Everyone says it's really good. Again, it's called Bimini Run, and it's been reprinted a million times. But oddly, it doesn't. It's not available today as an ebook. I don't really understand why. Most of Hunt's vintage genre fiction was released under pseudonyms. And let's walk through some of the most popular ones. Gordon Davis was one of his pseudonyms. Now, oddly, this was also a pseudonym used by Len Levinson, Len Levinson for his Sargent series, but I think that's probably just a coincidence. Uh, Hunt was also P.S. Donahue, David St. John, Robert Dietrich. Now, Eric, you have some experience with the Robert Dietrich books. Why don't you tell us what you know about those? We'll start there. Yeah, so I was introduced to Howard Hunt's work through Lee Goldberg and Joel Goldman's Cutting Edge Books imprint. They've been putting out a lot of great stuff lately, and Goldberg has gravitated to the Hunt novels written under the name Robert Dietrich. There were 12 novels total under the name Robert Dietrich, but 10 of these books make up the Steve Bentley series. This series ran for nine novels from 1957 through 1962, Hunt even revisited the series in 1999 with one additional book featuring uh, an aged Steve Bentley character. But who is Steve Bentley? Uh, surprisingly, he's just a Washington, D.C. tax accountant. So it's not exactly the trade one looks for when cranking up action and adventure for a fictional hero. Bite your tongue, sir. I have an accounting <laughs> degree myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, Hunt makes it work somehow. Uh, so the first book I read was the series debut, Murder on the Rocks, from 1957. In it, we learned that Bentley is a Korean War veteran who later went on to become an employee of the U.S. Treasury Department. His experience there led him to breaking a lot of black market rings globally. But somewhere along the way, Bentley, he becomes jaded with the D.C. political scene. And, you know, he resigns or, or retires or, or whatever, and he does taxes for various clients going forward. That's his new career. So for fun... Uh, Bentley drinks scotch, and he loves to boat around D.C. He's mostly a loner, uh, and he plays everything straight. You're not going to find a lot of uh, humor or sarcastic bits with Bentley. Uh, instead, what you get is uh, a lot of private eye genre tropes uh, throughout the uh, series. In the first book, Murder on the Rocks, Bentley is visited by a woman named Iris who wants to pay him to locate a valuable emerald that has ties to the ambassador of South Africa. Bentley explains he really isn't into any type of private eye work, and he sort of just balks at the whole thing. But Iris and her sexy sister, Sarah, they tease Bentley into doing the job. Um, so Hunt's narrative involves theft. It involves sultry women, and it's got some murder thrown in. And I liked this debut, but I didn't love it. Uh, it seemed like Hunt was just getting his feet wet with the character, and it just wasn't a smooth telling. Now, the book I want to review for show listeners is End of a Stripper. Do you want me to do that now or at the end? No, knock it out now. Just, 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 we're, okay. on, we're on topic. Let's do it. All right. So, man, I love this novel. Uh, this is the second installment in the Steve Bentley series, and it was published in 1959. In End of a Stripper, Bentley is just minding his own business, and he's entertaining this old military buddy at a swanky strip club called Chanticleer. Uh, and close to his seat is this man taking some quick snapshots of this gorgeous Scandinavian stripper named Linda Lee. And, he, you know, he's just kind of sitting there watching the show, and these two bouncers come up, and they see the man taking photos, and they, they sort of violently just drag him out into the street. But in the man's struggles, he slips this tiny camera into Bentley's pocket. So Bentley finds the camera, but doesn't think much of it, until he reads in the newspaper that the man was a low-shelf private eye named Mousy and that he was found murdered in a nearby warehouse. So after the same club bouncers find their way to Bentley, they threaten him to pony up the camera. Bentley says he doesn't know what they're talking about, and he just sort of avoids the first skirmish intact. The camera itself shows some murky photos of the stripper, but Bentley feels that something strange and mysterious about the whole thing. So he begins by tracking down the stripper to sort of learn uh, you know, what she's all about. By doing so, he gets retangled into all the inner workings of D.C.'s politics and a scandal with a U.S. congressman. There's sex, but it isn't graphic. Bentley has an on-and-off-again fling with a woman, but eventually beds down the gorgeous stripper. Their relationship was really touching, and I thought it was a big part of uh, Hunt's narrative. There's a scene near the end, Tom, where I was really hesitant on turning the page because I just knew bad things were happening to these characters. That's a great feeling. <laughs> well, it's funny because I was laying in bed reading, right? I, I do a lot of that, and I'm lying by my wife. And she she looks over, and I sort of throw down my iPad. And I said, 
man, I can't believe that this has happened. I, I feel horrible. Like it's just it's gonna keep me up tonight. Yeah, it's just such a testament to somebody's writing that it they can really make is. you care about a character that much that you don't want to turn the page because you know something bad is about to happen to them. It's... And that's the way I felt with this. Um, and I'm not gonna ruin it for listeners, but it was a really moving, effective scene, and it gave me a lot of respect and admiration for Bentley. Uh, and I was really fired up for the book's ending. Uh, but anyway, this was such a great book, and it's a true highlight of the year so far for me. Again, it's End of a Stripper by Howard Hunt, writing as Robert Dietrich. And I want listeners to know that the first Steve, the first three Steve Bentley novels are available on Amazon in both paperback and ebook. Uh, they're Murder on the Rocks, End of a Stripper, and the third book, which is House on Q Street, which I hope to read soon. They're reprinted by Cutting Edge, and they're all affordable. And I'm not sure if I'm really at liberty to say this, um, but Lee Goldberg shared it with me. So I'm going to share it with you. He's got a seven-book omnibus coming out that's called Bentley for Hire. And it will feature these books, uh, the first three that we just talked about, plus Mistress to Murder, Calypso Caper, Murder on Her Mind, and Angel Eyes. I'm not sure if Cutting Edge has the rights to all the Bentley novels, but maybe we'll find out in the coming weeks. Good news. Now, he wrote a couple standalones under the Dietrich name as well, right? He did, and I think I found them on your shelf. Yeah, so take a look. Just give them the titles because we want to hype this guy. Yeah, so this isn't uh, part of the Steve Bentley. These are the two that weren't. Uh, So it's Be My Victim and One for the Road. Yeah, they both look real good, so I'm going to check them out. I want to talk about his books under the Gordon Davis pseudonym for a minute. They mostly appear to be standalone novels. The one that's received the most shine lately, I'm going to hand this across to you, you've probably seen this, you probably have it, is uh, um, over the past decade, it's called House Dick. It's about a hotel detective. It was reprinted by Hard Case Crime under Howard Hunt's own name. I've been meaning to read this forever, and I never seem to get around to it, which is kind of the story of my life with most of these books on the shelves here. Um, friend of the show, James Reasoner, says it's quite good, and uh, you should have zero trouble finding it because Hard Case Crime had great distribution. Again, that's House Dick, the vintage paperback released under the Gordon Davis name, and the Hard Case Crime reprint uh, under Howard Hunt's own name. Um, I did read and review a Gordon Davis book that I hand across to you here. I think you saw this oh, yeah. from 1965 called While Murder Waits. It was just okay. It was a murder mis- I'm sorry, it was a mystery adventure written after the Bay of Pigs fiasco where Cuban exiles from Miami tried to invade Cuba and oust or kill Fidel Castro, who was the Soviet-backed president of Cuba. It was a CIA-sponsored event, and Howard Hunt was said to be involved in this failed operations and, like, the planning and financing of it. I imagine that this book, While Murder Waits, was his way of writing about the Cuban exiles while he was trying to process this failure. Anyway, in the book, a treasurer of a Cuban exile group comes up missing along with $250,000 raised from Cuban dishwashers in Miami. The Cubans hire a Cuban-American attorney to find the missing treasure and the money. The novel was okay, but you really need to be genuinely interested in Cuban exile politics to enjoy it. I'm not sorry I read it, but it wasn't exactly my thing. I would say that the salacious Fawcett gold medal cover was great, but totally misrepresented everything about the book. The last pseudonym I want to touch upon is David St. John. I'm going to hand you two of these books. You ever see these around? Uh, Return from Vorkuta yeah. and the Towers of Silence, which I have uh, one of these. Okay, can... so using that pseudonym, uh, Hunt wrote a series of spy novels starring a CIA operative named Peter Ward. And it must have been quite successful because I see them everywhere in used bookstores. The series was later reissued under Hunt's own name in the 1970s when the publisher was trying to capitalize on the fact that Hunt had suddenly become famous in the weight of that Watergate burglary I told you about. Some editions of the paperback brag that he was actually convicted of the burglary, which is sort of a weird flex because (laughs) he was a pretty inept burglar. Anyway, there are nine books in the Peter Ward series between 1965 and 1971. In the books, Ward helps Soviet scientists defect. He dodges enemy assassins. He tries to learn the truth about assassinated foreign leaders. Pretty standard 180-page spy books. The Spy Guys and Gals website said it's a good series, and they actually give it a B. Uh, he, the Randall over there says that the plots are never outrageous or ridiculous and that Hunt has a knack for creating really loathsome bad guys. Based on that recommendation, I may blow the dust off a few of those and read them. That's pretty much all I got for Howard Hunt. It's um, it's not a name that everyone would know today except for paperback warriors like us if it weren't for these Watergate burglaries. Um, but his output was pretty impressive, even if the books weren't always amazing. What's really funny when I was reading um, his uh, Steve Bentley books is that in a way, uh, Hunt 
is he's criticizing Washington D.C. for all their um, all their criminal activity within the within the political scene, right? Yeah, and he's um, you know he, he's doing an outcry against the government, and just he's basically just it, he's doing everything that you would think that a noble uh, a noble guy would be doing, but at the same time, when you look at what he did with Watergate. He just became what he despised. Yeah, I mean, listen, this guy was a villain. Let's, there's no way to talk about it other than him being a villain. The idea of somebody trying to like subvert the, you know, or the election of you know the right. president of the United States by conducting a burglary to steal secrets from the enemy party. That's just not something we should be doing. So this is not a guy that I'm holding out as a hero. But his fiction output was nothing short of remarkable because he's doing right. this while he's a CIA right. guy. I can't even wrap my head around that. Yeah, it's like he's just um, going off on all these international tangents and just sitting in the hotel writing. Yeah. So I, I got a review to do. Is that cool? We, yeah. All right. So Go for it. The, I'm going to review a book called 44 it, uh, by H.A. DeRoso. And it's 44 like 44 caliber. So when you look it up, it's dot point forty four dot forty four, but like 44 by H.A. DeRoso. Have you, have you ever seen this book? I'm going to hand this across to you. Yes. It's a, okay, it's a reference guide compiled by Paul Bishop and Scott Harris titled 52 Weeks, 52 Western Novels. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's, and it's a great reference book, not just because I have an entry in there. Um, there's an essay by author Peter Branvold gushing about this 1953 paperback that I read called 44 by H.A. DeRoso. Branvold makes the point, which made me want to read it, that the short book is really a noir novel wrapped in Western packaging. And so as soon as I heard that this is a Western noir, I knew they were speaking my language and I had to read this. Dan Harland is the main character. He's a cowboy turned gunslinger who became an assassin for hire. As the novel opens, he's doing a paid hit, killing somebody, and it takes an unexpected direction when his intended target, this fast draw named Lancaster, allows himself to be killed by Harland without putting up any resistance. Why on earth would someone do that? And that's really the focus of the novel. It really amounted to suicide, and it begged a ton of questions that Harland wanted answers. The experience of murdering a willing victim was profound enough to bring Harlan to the conclusion that he has had enough of the killing game. Lancaster could have easily shot Harlan, but instead he chose to die. By Harlan's old-fashioned honor code, he owes Lancaster his life. Now, Harlan was hired for the Lancaster hit by a middleman who refuses to share the identity of the ultimate client who paid for the job. Harlan becomes obsessed with the idea of finding the hidden client, and he goes on basically an investigative quest to settle the score in Lancaster's memory. What we have here is just a genuinely unique mystery where the murderer himself is on a journey to solve his own victim's murder. The hitman searches for his mystery client story becomes a recurring theme later in Max Allen Collins' Quarry series, but DeRoso's take is way darker. It's, it's really just a melancholy work of noir fiction. This is one of the best westerns I've read in ages. It's also one of the finest noir mysteries I've read. If you want, it makes me want to explore more of DeRoso's body of work. Unfortunately, the author died in 1960 of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. To this day, I don't think people know for sure if it was an accident or a uh, suicide. Since the novel's Lion Books release in 1953, 44 has been reprinted several times, and it's currently available as an ebook and as an audiobook. And it's great news since the book is just a masterpiece, and it should be required reading for noir and Western fans. It's really just the highest recommendation. Did H. A. DeRosso, uh, DeRosso, did he write any other westerns? Or yeah, he wrote a ton of books, and okay. um, and actually, it's if you're looking for a bargain and you're an audiobook kind of person, if you got the Hoopla app through your library system, uh, there's a bunch of H. A. DeRosso uh, westerns, all of which are supposed to be good, but 44 is like top of the heap, available as audiobooks. And so, as the country begins opening up and I begin taking my show on the road again. I intend to download and uh, listen to more of them because this was just a really, really impressive book. Hey, so when you mention uh, that this one came out through Lion Books, I tend to think that Lion mostly did crime noir and crime fiction novels. Did Lion release a number of Western titles? I think so. Again, I don't have a full grasp on their entire output, but I remember being in that weird used bookstore in the secret room in Detroit. Oh, yeah. 
and I l- went to the Lions book section, and I thought it was just gonna be all like hard boiled crime noir, and I would just like push them all into like a giant box and walk out the door, paying a fortune for them. But they had like romances, they had um, you know kind of juvenile delinquent books, they had you know, some reprints, and they had a handful of westerns. But I think that the reason we remember them today is because of their crime noir outfit um, uh, output, uh, and um, but. If it, it, it was also weird because when you look up 44 uh, by H.A. DeRoso in, in Google and you look at the images, this book has been released by almost every single publisher in the history of publishing. It, it's just it's been reprinted so many times with so many covers um, from that same era. I, I don't know how all that works from a business point of view. Do you see that book in stores? No, I never see it in the store. Yeah, so I, I, I ended up getting it as an audio book. Um, but it's, it's available as a cheap ebook too. It's not okay. hard to find. Anyway, I think that should probably wrap it up. We're hitting, we're hitting the time here, and that concludes today's episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Please join us on Facebook to see the covers of all these books we discuss, and join the conversation with our listener community. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week with a really cool episode.